we're living through incredibly challenging times. We're just emerging now from a long and dark night of isolation and uncertainty, of pandemic and polarization. We're living through an era of profound moral awakening. The ground is shaking and we've worked so hard, but we're not nearly done. In fact, we're really just getting started. Ikhar was founded on the core belief that faith communities need to be not only sources of spiritual strength, but voices of moral courage, that we have to be first responders to indifference and injustice. We hear the voice of our Jewish faith and our Jewish tradition calling us, demanding of us that we become agents of social change. We know and we believe that if we really dream of building the beloved community out there, we have to start by building sacred community right here and right now. A community that stands together in spiritual strength and spiritual resistance. And so we stand in friendship with our multi-faith partners around the country working to build a more just and loving society. We stand in hope because hope is the greatest expression of defiance against a politics of pessimism and a culture of despair. We stand in love because we trust in the mysterious power of human connectedness. This is the real work of community, to show up, to answer each other's loneliness with presence, to say amen to each other's mourner's cottage, and in a world that's turned upside down, to remind each other again and again and again what's right side up. Our ancestors were dreamers. They held the audacious belief that every single human being is created in God's own image. Fueled by that prophetic vision, we lift up a theology of radical equality because we truly believe that every single person deserves to live in full dignity. And the only way we build a society of love and justice is together. So come dream with us, come pray with us and cry with us and dance with us and come build with us. Help us usher in this new day. Good evening, friends, and welcome. Welcome, everyone. You know, in our house, we love Keith Jarrett's concert in Cologne from 1975. Maybe you know this concert. Have you heard it? Some folks? Oh, it's incredible. And there's an incredible story about it that I just want to share with you for a moment. Um, Keith Jarrett, this incredible jazz musician, was booked to speak, to sing, to do a performance at the Cologne Opera House. It was 1,400 seats. It was a sold-out concert. But apparently, the young staffer who was in charge of coordinating everything um, brought the wrong piano. And apparently, it was the worst piano ever. So the keys were sticky, and, and the pedals didn't work, and the whole up upper register sounded really harsh and tinny, and Jarrett's like, I'm not playing this. I can't do it, and, uh, and he storms out. And people are starting to arrive. They're starting to make their way in, and it's pouring rain out in, in, in Cologne, in, in Germany, and, and it's a disaster. And, and one of the staff members, the young, the young person in the first place with the piano, went outside and basically begged him to come back in, and, um, and he pitied her, and so he did. And, Lauren Buckman sent me, um, he sent me a podcast on TED Radio Hour that describes this moment. This moment because, um, as they say, Keith Jarrett had been handed a mess. He embraced the mess and it soared. And they say that that concert in Cologne in 1975 was not only his best work ever, but it was the best-selling jazz piano album of all time. And I love that story so much. Um, I wanted to start with that tonight, on this holiest night of the year before we hear Kol Nidre, because that is also the promise of Yom Kippur. 
It's the promise of the possibility of transformation. Our work tonight is to take the jumbled, hot mess of our lives and our times and transform it into something beautiful and something full of promise. So here's what you need to know. Keith Jarrett did not want to do it. He tried to bail. The hard work, the creative work, the transformative work is really terrifying. And you may, at times, over the next 25 hours, just want to bail. But I hope that you won't, because on this day, we have holy and honest and important work together. We have to peel away the many, many layers of self-protection that now are covering our deeply scarred hearts. We have to figure out how to be honest with ourselves in a time of so much dishonesty and disinformation. We have to try to reach something deeper, something greater, something beyond ourselves. We have to try to access a truth that comes from deep within. And for that, we're going to have to be willing to be in the mess of it all. So for those of you who are not in this room right now, whether you're in our tent outside or you're with us from your home or you're in a friend's backyard, I want to tell you that I know that it's very strange um, to do Yom Kippur this way. I know that this holy and hard work that I'm talking about is not really intended to happen over a screen. And yet, I learned from last year a really important lesson, which is that it is possible for us to be moved greatly and to move one another greatly, even when we're not even in the same room at the same time. So I am inviting you, who are not here in this room right now, to please not watch us, but to join us, to not listen to us, but actually to add your voices to ours, to turn a little corner of your home into a mikdash ma'at, a little sacred space, a place where it's okay to fall apart a little bit, a place where it's okay to cry, even to dance, and also to be lifted back up. And for those of you who are here in this room, that is what we're going to be doing here today as well. By the end of the day tomorrow, I hope that we will be soaring. That is what tends to happen on this holy day when we put the time and the effort and the love into this work. You know this is my favorite day of the year. It starts now. I really hope that we're able to find our breath, to remember what matters most. I hope that tomorrow night when the sun starts to set and the stars emerge, that we will feel a little bit lighter, a little bit more hopeful, a little bit sweeter. I invite you to please rise in whatever way you're able for Kol Nidre on page 204.
sare ushvu
Рабана, но дея Харимна. Yom Kippurim Abaleinu Letovah Oh Icharat Nabion Ah Baruch Adonai Hamvorach, 
Le'olam Moed. You can have a seat if you'd like. Umabir yom, umabir laila, umabdil ben yom, uben laila, Adonai tzvavot shemo, el chai bekayam tamidim lochaleinu leolam voel, baruch ata Adonai. So in a lot of ways, we have been training for this very moment, for Yom Kippur, for about 18 months. Tomorrow, wear the exact same thing you are tonight. Maybe slippers. Don't shower. Neglect some uh, personal hygiene. That's what Yom Kippur is asking us to do. And I think the pandemic has really 
we helped prepare us for today. But there's one thing, there's one aspect of Yom Kippur that I, I think has been a lot harder this past year, year and a half. And that's the prayer part. Did anybody notice the, the masks on the shofar wrote last week for Rosh Hashanah? And, and someone came upstairs to blow shofar for the family services and realized how incredibly difficult it was. The mask on the shofar made it so much harder for those people to blow. I'm impressed on a typical year, but all the more so right now. It's these masks. These masks make it harder. They make it harder to breathe. They make it harder to speak, to cry, to sing, to pray. They just make it harder. And so we have to work a little bit harder than in the past. And we've had to work harder this past year and a half to really cry out and to pray and to sing, and to sing songs of grief and to sing songs of celebration, all of it. So we're going to practice tonight to start to open our voices, to start to make ourselves as strong as those Baalei Tekiah were last week, those shofar blowers who will hear again at the very end of this 25-hour gift, this opportunity. And so we're going to start with a prayer that's familiar to many of us, Shema. And it's one that we always give breath to. So tonight, all the more so, I want to invite us to give it, give it a full breath. And if those first six words of Shema are not enough for you to start stretching, Yom Kippur is the only time of year that we also say that next line out loud as well. Please join us on page 208 for Shema. Shema. Yeah. 
to me.
Migratory birds navigate the journey to where they need to be? How do they maintain their trajectory when over the course of a few days, everything they could use to stay oriented will all change? Familiar sights and sounds are replaced by new landscapes. Some say that these birds are born with the genetic memory needed to make this journey an evolutionary imprint from past generations who similarly traveled this migratory path. But that theory is complicated by an experiment several years ago in which scientists trapped a group of white-crowned sparrows and transported them in a windowless compartment 3,000 miles east of where they had been. But upon release, they course corrected. These birds knew exactly where to go despite a journey that none of their ancestors had traveled. How do we know where to go when we're lost, painfully far from where we need to be? How do we keep our focus, our direction, our hope when all familiar landscapes and landmarks disappear. Well, here's how the white-crowned sparrow does it. They have what amounts to a compass that lives on their retinas that's always attuned to the Earth's magnetic field, a magnetism that isn't impacted by shifting landscapes. Using this internal compass and Earth's magnetism, they find their way home. We have that compass as well. But it's often hidden, drowned out by other voices vying for our attention. Our conscience is our compass. So linked are these two words that the Hebrew terms are barely distinguishable. Compass is matzpen, conscience matzpun. And the silence of prayer 
always available to us is our magnetic field. Find the compass within, the conscience that speaks truth, and let it guide you home. The silent Amida is found on page 213. Please rise in every way you're able. Shalom, dear friends. My name is Achinoam Nini. Achinoam is the beautiful name my father and mother who are here tonight gave me. And it means sister of peace. When I started my career 30 years ago, I realized nobody could say Achinoam, except for the people in this room, maybe. I took on the name Noah. Noah was the first feminist in the Bible, but I very quickly decided Noah would stand for not only Achinoam. And then my career became a family affair with wonderful musicians and technicians which have been with me often for more than two decades. With my family, of course, and three children, my husband of 30 years as well, my partner of 30 years, marathon runner. I'm so grateful for the opportunity after so many years to be standing here before you because everything we do in our lives always brings us to one moment and that one moment is now. I heard Hillel saying that they've been practicing for some months for this absolutely beautiful musical presentation that we've all heard. I have to say, you moved my heart so deeply I have no words to say, all of you. And I feel I've been practicing for 30 years for this little piece I'm going to sing for you. It's a total improvisation. I haven't thought of anything and decided that whatever was in my heart would come out when the moment was right. Thank you for this opportunity. Mm -hmm. 
Shut up. in love with Achi Noam Mimi in 2014 <laughs> when she wrote in the midst of a Gaza war that there were only two sides in this battle 
but they were not Israelis and Palestinians, Jews and Arabs. They were moderates and extremists. And you threw down the gauntlet. You called out. I don't know if you knew that we were listening here, but we were. You were essentially asking us to decide which side of history we want to stand on. The side of violence, supremacy, hatred, cruelty, and narrow-mindedness, or the side of love. And I thank you. We heard you, and we hear you. God has blessed you in so many ways. First, with a heart that can feel so deeply, and then with a voice that can communicate that incredibly powerful message to the rest of us. You wrote these words. You sang these words with Mira Awad. When I cry, I cry for both of us. My pain has no name. When I cry, I cry to the merciless sky and say there must be another way. And you're right. There is another way, a way of love, a way of justice, a way of dignity for all of God's children. And we're so grateful to you for being that messenger here tonight and every day. May you continue to be blessed. Noah will join us again tomorrow and sing with all of us again. We're so, so grateful to have you with us. We are gonna now turn to page 223. I invite you to please rise as the ark is open. for the Yud Gimel Midot, the 13 attributes of God. Vayavor Adonai al palno vayikra Adonai, Adonai el rachum vechanun el kapayim verach hesed ve'emet notzer chesed la'am
Turn to page 233 for Kabel Berachamim Uben at Zom Et Filoteinu Ashiveinu Adonai Alecha Venashov Humba Chadesh Yameinu Yeah. 
central mitzvah, the central act of Rosh Hashanah. What is it? What is it? Hearing the shofar. Hearing the shofar. Hearing the shofar. That is the central commandment. That is what we do on Rosh Hashanah. We, we are commanded to hear the sound of the shofar. What is the central act? What is the central mitzvah of Yom Kippur? What is it? Probably a lot of you thinking fasting, and the mind goes to fasting. That's, that's, this is the, the big fast day. No, no. Fasting is not the essence of the day. In the, in the rabbinic tractate, Yoma, fasting is saved for the last chapter. It's an afterthought. The central mitzvah of Yom Kippur is the vidui, the confession. We do it, we do it nine times over the course of this holiday. I do it, we do it personally, and the centerpiece of this holiday, the great avodah service, involves the high priest doing a series of confessions. Confessions, confession is the central act of Yom Kippur. And it has to be spoken. Maimonides says, vidui ze vidui dvarim. It has to be spoken out, the, the confession of words. And that means that the central act of Rosh Hashanah is taking a sound from outside and letting it enter inside of you. And the central act of Yom Kippur is bringing a sound up from inside of you and letting it out into the world. And I don't think that's a coincidence. These holidays serve as bookends to a process, to an experience that we're trying to have. And on Rosh Hashanah, we begin that process by opening our ears, by opening our hearts, by opening ourselves, by letting the world enter, letting God enter letting the people around us enter into our hearts, into our sight, into our sounds, to take the experience of the world inside. And then we let it sit there. We let it, we let it jingle and jangle around inside of us, that sound, for, for a week, for 10 days. And on Yom Kippur, it's time to let the sound come back out. And when it comes out, it is changed because it went inside of you. And what comes out of you is uniquely your sound. On Rosh Hashanah, we all hear the same sound. On Yom Kippur, we all produce our own unique individual sound, individual call. So let's, let's begin the process of, of, of bringing out what is deep inside of revealing some part of ourselves to the world. We took the world in, the world that we have no control over, the world that is loud and unruly and, and, it, and, it, and it entered inside of us. And when it comes back out, our response to what is going on in the world, that's what we have control over. That's what we're finding on Yom Kippur. That's what we're revealing on Yom Kippur. So let's begin that revelation with the vidui on page 235. Anu azefani biyata rachum bichanu Anu kshayore biyata erech apayim Anu melei avor biyata malei rachamim Anu yameinu kitzel over Vetahu shnotecha lo yitamu Elohim levoteinu tavo Lefanecha techinatenu Veal titalam mitchinatenu Sheyein anachnu azei fanim Ukshei orev Lomar lefanecha Adonai Elohim 
243 for Avinu Malkenu. Avinu Malkenu Chotanu Levanecho Avinu Malkenu Ven lanu melech elewata Avinu Malkenu 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 Avinu Avinu Malkenu Avinu Malkenu Avinu Malkenu Avinu Malkenu Avinu Malkenu Avinu Oh, 
beloved community members. Ali Weinstein is a board member, and Jeremy, please come on up, and we welcome you here this evening. You can take it off. During COVID, the thing that kept me sane was running. I've always been a runner. I ran competitively from fourth grade through college. And to this day, running still relaxes me, clears my mind, and makes me feel alive. On March 19th, 2021, around 3 p.m., I left our home and headed east. I approached an intersection. The light was red, so I stopped. It turned green. I looked both ways. There were no cars coming, so I jogged through the crosswalk. Around dinner time, I realized Allie had not returned from her run. I called her, no answer. I went onto my iPhone to see where she was. The dot came up at Cedar Sinai, the North Tower, where the emergency room is. I turned it off, I turned it back on, still there same location. My worst fear had become the reality. Our kids, sensing something was wrong, asked, where is mommy? I didn't know what to say. I scrambled for a babysitter, then raced off to Cedars. When I arrived, I was shepherded to the ICU. I walked in and saw my wife, her neck in a giant stabilizer, the hospital staff swarming around her bed, and Allie was screaming. I woke up seven days later. I'd been hit by a drunk driver who ran a red light and then sped off, leaving me in a gutter to die. I was hit at 50 miles per hour and my body flew 30 feet in the air. I had six broken ribs, six cracked teeth, a torn ACL and postlateral ligament, a fractured right foot, a fractured knee, a severed ulnar nerve, and a right arm so mangled that my elbow bone was in my shoulder. I had four surgeries in seven days, including a 10-hour limb salvage procedure but my arm was saved. 14 days after arriving, I left the hospital where I birthed my three babies, but now I was the baby. I was too fragile to be back at home with our grabby two-year-old whom I so desperately wanted to hold. I needed my parents to drive me, to bathe me, to put my hair in a ponytail, and to oversee my medications and the vast array of appointments. I was in a state of absolute panic and shock. Allie and I had been married for almost 10 years. We have three little children, and anyone who knows us knows that Allie is the hyper-organized supermom who keeps 15 balls in the air and never drops one of them. She handles more things in our lives than I even know are going on, and now she was in the ICU we were all preparing for a series of major surgeries and an unfu uncertain future. And then you all showed up. Allie was hit on a Friday afternoon, and by Saturday morning, this community was saying Misha Berach for her 
and Rabbi Braus came to visit me at the hospital. I received calls, texts, emails, coffee deliveries, bounce houses, bubble parties, babysitters, and playdates. Meals showed up daily for us for months, many from families we didn't know. Elizabeth Sager appointed herself our official head of operations and ran our family down to the smallest logistical detail. Our girls' spring break became Camp Weinstein, organized by our ECAR friends. Our daughters were driven to dance and soccer practice. Thoughtful care packages showed up to entertain myself. ECAR assembled a notebook of handwritten notes and emails, giving me love and support, many from ECAR from afar members who I'd never met. You all cared for my family while I couldn't. And this allowed me to work really hard to get better so I could heal. How do you tell a two-year-old, four-year-old, and six-year-old that their mommy had been hit by a drunk driver while out for a run? Well, Ikar has Maura Beth and Maura Jane, who are at the ECC, and they told me exactly what to say. Ikar has always been there for Jeremy and me. The births of our daughters, the first day of preschool, bite-sized Shabbat, but what I never imagined was suffering a trauma like this and how critical Ikar would be to my recovery. And the reality is, at some point, we are all going to face the darkness. Whether it's the death of a loved one, a divorce, the loss of a pregnancy, or a frightening diagnosis. I've learned that life is random and there is so much we can't control. But we can choose our community. We've learned the hard way how life-sustaining this community really is. So tonight, we're asking you to join us in supporting this amazing organization. It is easy to forget, but behind all of the eCar love is an organization that employs people and maintains facilities. Our membership dues only go so far. 30% of the operating budget for the year comes from this moment. So please, take out your pledge card or donate electronically. What can you give? Can you give a little bit more this year? On Yom Kippur, we beat our chest and we ask for forgiveness. Let's not add cheaping out on our pledge cards to this year's list of sins. And let me tell you guys something. Your bank account is not your safety net. Ecar is. So give, and give as generously as you can, because there's something about opening your heart and giving to an organization you care about that will allow you to open your heart and receive in your time of need. Thank you. Good, Yanta. Jeremy and Ali, I, I want to thank you um, for speaking tonight. Um, literally, Ali was in the ICU, and the moment that she was having her turning point, and, and it was clear, thank God, that you were going to survive. Jeremy's like, I'm so giving the Kol Nidre pitch this year. And I, I think, um, I mean, in your mind, you thought, I need to let the community know how important it is to support the community. But I know that you also recognized in that moment how precious life is and how close we all stand to the edge, which is the message of this holiday. And um, Ali, Ali said she, she, was, uh, she was not conscious for about seven days. And um, when you, when the first time we spoke, I don't know if you're, I don't think you remember this call, but Ali said, I've got the best idea for a fundraiser when I get out of this. And it's, uh, it's pretty incredible the way that the two of you have, um, have continued to find your way back to community as community has found its way to you. Um, you've always been such a blessing to us and I'm so grateful and thankful that you are, that you're alive and recovering. May you continue to heal and find renewed strength every day as your body and your spirits heal. 
I also want to spend um, some love and prayers uh, for healing to your exceptional mother, to Patty, Dr. Patricia Gordon, who was just named a CNN hero uh, for her work in pioneering this inventive, actually genius screening method for cervical cancer. Um, cervical cancer is the leading cause of, uh, of cancer deaths among women in the developing world. And, and Patty, who had a thriving practice here in LA, um, figured that she could go travel around the world and teach women how to protect themselves from this cancer. And she has saved countless lives. And I bless uh, Patty that she might continue um, to find strength as she uses her gifts to, to bring healing to those who need it most. Um, I do want to mention tonight that we were just given in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur a very generous double chai matching gift. That's $36,000 um, to help, specifically to help cover the cost of broadcasting our Shabbat services. This is an Ikar from a FAR member who is so grateful that even uh, from afar, um, he and his family are able to find their way to our services and have found incredible meaning in that. So um, we have to, uh, to activate that gift. We have to raise um, the money. Uh, we have to double that. And so I hope we can at least do that. Um, that would be, uh, that, that's what we're, um, we're really hoping that people will give as generously as you're able. We know this has been a really hard time for many people and we'll, we're incredibly grateful to you for supporting in whatever way you're able. You do have a card inside your e-card if you're here in person, either outside in the tent or here in this room. Um, I invite you to take it out. There's stickies. You can put a little sticker on it um, and, and tell us what, what you're able to contribute this year. And if you're with us online, we'd be so grateful. Um, I know that we're, we're right now being joined by people from literally around the world. And um, if everybody gives, we're able to do the work uh, that we do here. So thank you. Thank you for being so generous. Um, we're going to give you a moment. We invite Hannah to come forward. <laughs>
car has a new safety feature. When it drives in reverse, it blasts this high-pitched choir of angels. I don't know if any of you have this to warn anyone who happens to be walking behind the car to beware. And I try desperately to deactivate it, mostly on behalf of our neighbors who we felt should not have to hear the thunderous chorus of the heavenly host every time we backed up into our driveway. But the dealer said that it was designed to save lives, so we just had to get used to it. And I think now that it might be, because I've been surrounded daily by the sounds of the heavenly chorus, that I have lately been particularly attuned to angels which is actually what I want to talk about with all of you tonight. And I know that many of you are thinking that Jews don't really talk about angels, but the thing is they, they feature prominently throughout Torah, throughout our sacred texts, throughout our tradition. So I want to take a little bit of time tonight to explore and to see what we might learn. On Rosh Hashanah, Just 10 days ago, we read two stories, one on the first day, one on the second. Both of these were stories of Abraham from the book of Genesis. And in both of these stories, Abraham was called to do the unthinkable, to take the life of one of his beloved sons. And in both of those two stories, the course of events was turned not by man and not by God, but by an angel. So on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, you might remember, Abraham banishes his son Ishmael and his wife Hagar and sends them out into the barren desert. And Hagar quickly falls into despair. She's certain that they're going to die, and she places the boy down, and she starts to weep and to wail. She's broken. And then it is Malach Elohim, an angel of God, who appears before Hagar. al tir the angel says, Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy's cries, and he's going to survive. And in that moment, Hagar's eyes are opened, and miraculously, she sees a well of water that was actually just right in front of her. And the rabbis ask, did God place the well in that place in that moment? But no, they say, it was actually there all along, but in her grief, She was unable to see that the thing she needed most was actually right in front of her. Strengthened by the angel's promise, strengthened by the angel's presence, she was able to see what she couldn't see before. So this angel, then, is is a quiet, life-saving force that gives hope and gives strength to the anguished in their darkest moments. The next Abraham narrative is the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. We read this on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. And again, here, an angel figures prominently. Abraham is on top of the mountain. He's poised to slaughter Isaac, his beloved son. And again, it's not God, but it's an angel who calls out to him. And the angel of of, of the Lord calls to him and says, Abraham, Abraham. And he answers, here I am. And the angel says, don't you dare harm this child. Now, many rabbinic commentators suggests that the repetition of Abraham's name is an indication of urgency, that the angel needed to stop him before it was too late. But Rabbi Chia says in Bereshit Rabbah that actually it wasn't about urgency, it was an expression of love, as in, I love you too much to watch you do this terrible thing, to watch you hurt someone you love. This angel then is one that comes to a person in his most desperate hour, lovingly holding him to a higher standard than he even set for himself. And in that moment, you might remember Abraham looks up and he sees a ram that's caught in a thicket, and it occurs to him, uh, maybe I can offer God this ram instead of my son. It's an incredible act of chutzpah to give God a ram when God asks for a child. And yet, the angel's love somehow awakened Abraham's imagination. Before that, he thought there was simply no other choice. But now suddenly, he sees what's possible before him. These angels, they give Hagar and they give Abraham hope 
They help them find clarity. They awaken their moral imagination. In the Torah, angels are called melachim. They're called messengers. And it's said that every angel has a specific, particular mission, tasked with bringing a particular message to a particular person in a particular moment. So the three men that come to visit Abraham and Sarah are seen as three angels with three distinct messages. There's Raphael, the angel of healing, who's sent to support and comfort Abraham after his circumcision. There's Michael, who my brother was named after. This is the protector and the defender of Israel who came to tell Abraham and Sarah that they'd finally have a child. There's the mighty Gabriel himself, made of fire, who came in order to overturn Sodom and Gomorrah. In the most well-known angel narrative that appears in our Torah, Jacob is deeply vulnerable as he prepares to reunite with his brother Esau, whom he's been estranged from for many years. And in the night, he's attacked by an angel who comes in the form of a stranger. And they wrestle all night. And we know that it's the most intense struggle of Jacob's life. But in the break of dawn, Jacob grabs the angel and says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And in that moment, that angel offers him a new name, a new identity, a new sense of self-understanding. You will no longer be called Jacob. From now on, you will be Yisrael, for you are one who has wrestled with God and man and survived. With this blessing from the angel, Jacob finds the will and the strength to approach his brother in a spirit of love and reconciliation the next morning. These are all peak moments when the angel's presence is obvious and unmistakable, but there are other stories too, when their entire lives that hinge on far more subtle encounters with angels, so subtle that you might even miss them if you're not really paying attention to the text. Listen to what happened to Joseph when one day his father, Jacob, sends him out to check on his brothers who were pastoring to their flocks out in, in Shechem. And, and this is a treacherous mission from the start. I can't honestly figure out why Jacob sent his beloved son, Joseph, out to check on his brothers, who everybody knew hated Joseph because he had already told them twice that he had had these recurring dreams where he is reigning supreme over his brother. We also know that Shechem was a dangerous place for any of the sons of Jacob to be because they had just fought a battle in that place to avenge their sister's rape only, only a few years before. Anyway, Joseph goes out into the field to check on the welfare of his brothers. The problem is when he gets out there, he doesn't see his brothers anywhere, and he's about to return home safely. But then he bumps into a man, and he asks this random man, any chance you've seen my brothers? I heard they went that way, the man says, toward Dotan. And that's it. That, that's the end of that little episode. Joseph turns, and he walks that way toward Dotan. Had he returned home, had he gone back to his father Jacob that day, he would not have been thrown into the pit. He would not have been sold into slavery. Years later, when there's a famine in the land, the brothers might have gone down to Egypt seeking food. They would not have found Joseph as Pharaoh's chief advisor. They would not have been invited to stay in Egypt. They would not have become enslaved. When a new Pharaoh arose over Egypt, they would not have suffered hundreds of years of violent oppression, degradation, humiliation, and enslavement. And they would not have ultimately been redeemed by God's strong hand and outstretched arm. All of this transpired, our tradition wants us to understand, because a guy in a field said, I think they went that way, toward Dotan. So, so who is this guy? Our rabbis say that he's the angel Gabriel, and that he was sent by the Holy One in order to ensure that Joseph would fall into his brother's hands, just as God intended, so that our story as a people could ultimately unfold as it did with all of the trials and all of the pain and all of the suffering, but also the triumph and ultimately the redemption. The rabbis, the rabbis take it even further. Rabbi Simon says in the Midrash, he says that every single blade of grass has a constellation of angels surrounding it, coaxing it from the earth, whispering, Katal, 
Gadal, grow, grow. I've thought about that a lot over the course of these last couple of years as we've witnessed the scope and the scale of climate devastation brought about by impetuous, insatiable human beings. Every plant, every tree, every blade of grass was placed here with intention and with love, and yet, how reckless are we with God's creation? And, and, and listen to what Rabbi Yoshua Ben Levi says about angels. He says that every single person is surrounded wherever he goes by a procession of angels who are blowing horns and saying, make way for an image of the Holy One is approaching. I thought a lot, a lot about that last spring and summer after the murders of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. How deeply racism lives in the white body. How deeply it lives in our culture that again and again and again, the image of the Holy One is trampled before us. How else could we keep missing all of those angels with their trumpets and their proclamations begging us to see the divinity in every single human being? And, and there's so many more angel stories and teachings in the Torah, in the prophets, and judges, and, and, and among the rabbis. There are angels everywhere throughout our tradition, from our sacred text to our folklore to our liturgy. I hope you're seeing the through line here. Angels appear in this world, often in moments of incredible vulnerability, danger, fear, and they come to give us moral strength and clarity and hope to help us believe again. They challenge us to think creatively about what might be possible, and they let us know that we're not alone. They offer protection and connection and inspiration. It's Kol Nidre. Why am I sharing this with all of you tonight? Because I want to ask us to consider over the course of this next day together two stirring possibilities. One, that there really are angels everywhere, not only back then, but also in our time, also now. And that they're even in this room. They're even on this Zoom. I want to ask you to consider that there are those blessed souls who were brought into this world to do holy work, the holy work of transmitting sacred messages, of planting the seed of hope and possibility in the darkest of moments, just like Hagar's angel, of lovingly holding us to a better version of ourselves by holding up a mirror and saying, I know that you can do better. You can and you must live in greater alignment with your own values, calling us to cherish the preciousness of life like Abraham's angel did. That there are those who are tasked with wrestling with us, giving us strength and clarity, perseverance and resilience, especially in the moments when we're feeling the most vulnerable. And there are those whose sacred task is to gently, subtly point us in the right direction so that our stories can unfold with grace. There are God's angels everywhere, even here. And I know that you've encountered them. I know that you've encountered them in a quiet whisper, in a mysterious presence. I know you encountered an angel with the person who gave you a loan when you were desperate and then wouldn't let you repay it. I know you encountered an angel with the couple that calls you every Friday for three years just to check in after your son tragically died on a Friday. I know that you encountered an angel with the one who sat with you in the darkness, not to cheer you up, but just to be beside you. With the one who said your loved one's name at Kaddish when you couldn't make it to Morning Minion with the one who told you that her husband also has Parkinson's and she could help you make your way through the unknown, with the one who saw your beauty and your promise when you couldn't. I know you know that there are angels here too. You have all seen them, we have all seen them. The second thing that I wanna ask you to consider tonight is that you may be one of them. A few years ago, our beloved Marta Kaufman 
gave an incredible speech when she won a Lifetime Achievement Humanitas Award, and she spoke that night about the imposter syndrome. And I'll never forget this. Imposter syndrome is when somebody thinks that she's a fraud, and she lives in fear of being exposed as a fraud day in and day out. It's paralyzing. It is debilitating. Trust me. It leaves people who have it thinking that they don't deserve what they've got and that they fooled everyone in the world into thinking that they do. That night in that room, Marta Kaufman asked people to raise their hands if they'd ever experienced imposter syndrome. And in that room that night of brilliant, high-achieving TV and film writers, I was a plus one, um, almost every single person in the room raised their hands. It was right around this time that Andrew Solomon, who's a professor of psychology at Columbia University, wrote about the treacherous gap between public triumph and private despair, with the outer shell obscuring the real person, even to those with whom we have professed intimacy. We know that imposter syndrome can be not only painful, it can be fatal. In Jewish parlance, imposter syndrome is what we call the problem of Zusia. You probably heard about this at some point. Zusia, though he was a great rabbi, was afraid to die because he said he was ashamed to stand before God in judgment, having failed to live as deeply and faithfully as Abraham or Moses. And then his Rebbe tells him that actually he's got it wrong. That when he dies, God will not ask him, why were you not Abraham? Why were you not Moses? God will only ask, were you Zusia? Becoming ourselves, that is a spiritual imperative of the highest order for our own sakes and for the sake of the world. Because our tradition insists that every single person is unique. That of the billions of people who are alive on this planet, there has never been and there will never be another just like you, Kareem. That's it. Here you are. And it's only you. And it's also true about you, Sarah. And it's also true about Lirona. It's true about every single one of us. That is an incredible claim. And this summer, my dear friend, Rabbi Scheiheld, introduced me to the language of Rabbi Shlomi Volbe, the great 20th century master of Musser. And here's what he said. He said, I, with my unique combination of capabilities in this particular time and place, I am called to do what is undoubtedly a unique task before me. All of creation is waiting for me because I cannot trade my avodah, I cannot trade my core work with anyone else in the world. That is an incredibly daring theology. The idea that not only every angel but every single person was brought into the world with some higher purpose. In the language of the Sloan Rebbe, it's a shlichut eliona, something only we can do. Yes, just like the angels, every one of us was also sent here on a particular mission. Each one of us, messengers of the Holy One. I only wish that we could hear that. We inflict so much pain on ourselves because we don't believe that our voice will matter. We think someone else will be better qualified. We're afraid. We're distracted. We're really busy. We have these devices attached to our bodies. I think that might ultimately be the work of Yom Kippur, to peel away those protective layers around the heart that keep us from seeing who we really are and who we're actually called to be, so that when the moment arises, we will be ready to step up. There's a Mishnah that I have shared with this community many, many times. This is a text that absolutely changed my life when I encountered it, and changed my understanding of love, of human suffering, of the power of community. You may have heard me share this before. This Mishnah teaches that in temple times, Thousands of people would converge on the Temple Mount for pilgrimage, and all of them would enter the courtyard in one seamless mass. They would enter, they would circle around the perimeter to the right, and then they'd make their way out the very same door that they came in. But someone who's suffering, someone who's brokenhearted, someone who's lonely, someone who's grieving, someone who's sick, Misha Erudavar, someone to whom something awful happens, that person has to show up too. 
That person shows up through the same doorway that everyone else entered, but when she walks in, she turns to the left instead of the right. And she has to walk her way around that circle, but in the opposite direction. I just want you to think about that for a moment. When we're suffering, when our loved ones are hovering between life and death, when our lives are encased in darkness, when every instinct we have is to isolate, because who would understand our pain anyway? We are called to show up. We're called to walk against the grain. And now imagine this. You're on pilgrimage. You have saved up. You have planned. You have made reservations. You've waited for this holy moment. It might be the spiritual highlight of your life going to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage. And then here you are making your way around the courtyard. And this miskain, this, this broken guy is walking toward you. And all you want to do is avert your eyes because you're on a spiritual quest. But you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to. Every single person who passes by someone with a broken heart walking in the other direction is obligated to ask two simple words. Malach. Malach. What's going on with you? Where is your pain? Tell me. Tell me about your heartache. And this person, this person who's suffering would answer, I'm afraid. I am bereft. I am shattered. And then words of comfort are offered consolation, presence, love, I see you, each of them would say, you are not alone. The reason I'm telling you this story that I've told you a hundred times before is because listen to what I just realized this year about this story. This question, the question that we are called to ask one another, ma lach, that is precisely the question that the angel asked Hagar that day that the angel found Hagar weeping and wailing in the desert sun. Ma lach, Hagar, tell me about your pain, Hagar. And the message, it seems to me, is perfectly clear. Now it's we, it's each of us that's called to step into the role of the angel on earth and to ask ma lach, and in so doing to become the malach, to become the angel ourselves. You heard Ali and Jeremy's story tonight. You heard about how sometimes in life you go out for a run before Shabbat and you're struck and you're nearly killed by a drunk driver. And I really thank God. I thank God every day that you are before us and able to tell this incredible story, this miracle. And I know that you're healing and that you'll recover because you're one of the strongest and most willful and most beautiful people I know. There's another part of the story that I want to tell you tonight that Allie and Jeremy said it was okay to share. Allie might not be here tonight had it not been for a team of angels that saved her life. When the drunk driver hit Allie and started to speed away, there was a woman named Angie who was out for a walk with her two-year-old child, the same age as Allie and Jeremy's youngest child holding her little child in her arms in the face of this horrible accident, she ran into the middle of the intersection and she blocked incoming traffic with her body while calling 911. At just that same moment, there was a guy named James who was waiting at a red light in the other direction. And he also witnessed as Allie was struck he instinctively, without being asked, jumped out of his car to block the traffic coming from the other direction like Angie, James, protected Allie's body with his own. And also at that intersection, at that moment, there was a man named Andrew who, like Allie, was out for a run in the neighborhood that afternoon. And witnessing the impact of this accident, he ran after the car that struck her and shouted for the driver to stop. And then he raced back to where Ali was lying on the ground, and this stranger, some guy named Andrew, held her limp body in his arms, and he told her his name, and he spoke gently to her, and he told her that he would not leave her alone until help came. He may not have known that he was the help himself. I don't know any of these three people. 
I don't know why they converged on this street corner at precisely this moment, on precisely this day, or how they knew exactly what they needed to do in that moment. I know that their presence feels unquestionably holy to me. It is impossible for me to believe that this was not part of their shlichut, part of their higher purpose in this world. And I understand, even as I say this, that this raises some profound theological dilemmas. Why do angels sometimes appear just precisely at the moment that we need them, and yet sometimes they don't? I thank God that Allie was saved. I don't know why other people we love were not. The only thing that I can come to is that since we don't understand the inner workings of angels or God, when they're sent and why and how, all the more so every single one of us needs to make sure that we step forward when we are called. Toni Morrison gave an incredible eulogy for James Baldwin, and, and she closed it by quoting back his own words. He said, our crown has already been bought and paid for. All we have to do is wear it. I am asking us tonight to train our eyes in this time of so much suffering and such hard edges to see the angels that are before us and to know in our hearts that we too are called to wear our crown, to be those ministering angels in this broken world, Malachi Hasharit, messengers of the Holy One. I pray that we learn this year how to see the brokenhearted and rather than turn away, to ask Malach, tell me, tell me about your pain. May we attune our hearts to the call so that we step into the intersection just when we are needed. May we learn to wear our crown, a crown of humility, of presence, and love, just as angels do. Gamar Chatimatova and Shana Tova.
rise, page 246. We conclude our services with the Aleinu and closing prayers. Kadish Yatom is on page 247. We invite anyone who's grieving the death of a loved one or observing a yard site, the anniversary of a, of a loss, or just anyone who wants to feel close to the presence of a loved one who's no longer in this world in physical form, please join us, page 247. Amen. Amen. Lechaye Hon, Uvyome Hon, Uvhaye, the whole Beit Israel, Ba Agala, Uvisman Kari, the Imru, Amen. Yehesh me, Rabba, Mevorach, Le Alam, Ulome, Omaya. Yit Barach, the Yishtabach, the Yit Baar, the Yit Romam, the Yit Nase, the Yit Hadar, the Yit Ale, the Yit Halal, Shmei de Kudisha, Le Ela Ul Ela, Min Kobir Hata, the Shirata, Tushpe Hata, the Nechamata. Da Amiran be Oma ve Imru Amen. Yehesh Lama Rabamish Maya, the Chaim Alenu ve Al Koji Shoel ve Imru Amen. Oset Shalom Mim Romav, who ya Ase Shalom Alenu ve Al Koji Shoel ve Imru Amen. Amen. A couple of very quick announcements for us before we close tonight. Um, first, I want to thank very much um, our uh, our sponsors uh, for, for the High Holy Days this year. These are people who made very generous contributions so that we could make our High Holy Days free and totally accessible um, to anybody who wants to join us around the world um, online. I want to thank Rabbi Barbara Zaki. Um, I want to thank Roz and Abner Goldstein. Please tell your folks how grateful we are. Um, and Marta Kaufman, who gets a sermon shout out and then a thank you shout out. So we're, we're really, really grateful. Uh, got a little note from the husband that it seemed earlier, like I was saying, we only need to raise $36,000 tonight. 
which is not at all what I intended to convey. I was simply saying that that's one of the matching gifts that we got. We actually do, um, we, we raised nearly a million dollars, um, believe it or not, on Yom Kippur. It's how we bring in most of our budget for the year. So um, just to clarify, uh, we really need, do need and appreciate people stepping up. Um, and thank you, David, for the notes. I don't even have to wait to get home for notes. This is so good. Um, tomorrow morning, we're going to be starting at 9 a.m. Um, we will be saying Yiskor at 1 p.m. Um, that we're going to start Yiskor on time. Um, we're committed to that. Um, so there will be Yiskor, and we're going to be ha having a, like a real live rabbi-led Yiskor service, both in the tent outside and also here. We really wanted to make sure that everybody who's saying Yiskor is able um, to do so. We are then going to take a break, and people will go off-site, um, go home, take a nap. We will be back here for Mincha and Ne'ila um, at 6 p.m., and it's, of course, all of this is streaming uh, live tomorrow. Um, if you haven't yet gone to the Yisker Memorial Garden, um, it's incredibly beautiful um, and very, very meaningful. And, uh, and so I hope you'll take a little bit of time to stroll through the Memorial Garden um, before, we, uh, before we take it down. We still have a little bit more time, a few more days. I do want to give a shout out to Dennis and Jody Moss. Um, where are you? You're here somewhere. Oh, yeah. Hey, Mazel Tov. Um, they had their first date at Kol Nidre at Berkeley Hill 50 years ago today. And they're still going strong through, through grief and through goodness. And may you continue to be blessed. And you're such a blessing um, to our community and to all of us. Um, in a moment when we finish the service, I'm going to ask you to just, if you can, wait for a moment so that we can get a bunch of uh, clergy out there first so that we can greet you on your way out. You know I want to hug you all. You know I do. But um, I'm going to give you an elbow bump this time. Um, COVID it is still very real. And there are lots of breakthrough infections, and we need to protect each other um, and, and ourselves. And so I really want you all to be healthy and safe in this new year. Um, finally, the last thing I want to say is what I always say um, on Kol Nidre, which is I really hope that you'll stick it out. Um, give yourselves the gift of this sacred time. I know it's long. It's repetitive. You're like, why didn't somebody edit the Machsor? We could have done it one time instead of nine. But the thing is, it was designed this way because... Something happens to your heart when you keep going and going and going. And, um, and I know it and I believe it because it happens to us every single year here. So even um, when, you're, when you're feeling tired and, and, and bummed out and caught in the mess of it all, as we said when I started, um, I really hope you'll give yourselves the gift of this uh, very sweet connection this year. Um, I now am going to turn it over to Rabbi Tzadok, who's going to close this beautiful service with a blessing. Please rise in whatever way you're able. We close out our service. Eloheinu, velohe avotenu, v'imotenu. God, our God, God of our ancestors, God of strength and of compassion and of forgiveness and of reconciliation, grant us this Yom Kippur, the space to stretch, to cry, to celebrate, to discover. We will call upon your greatest attributes, and as we do, let us find them in ourselves as well. As you are Rahum, let us too be compassionate when we confront our faults and our failings. Just as you are Erech Apayim, let us be patient as we recognize the ways we are not yet who we hope to be. As you are Rav Chesed Ve'emet, help us to examine our deeds and our hearts with loving honesty. And let us trust that when we do, when we look inward with humility, we will discover strength, love, and possibility. For you are the source of life, and in your light we too see and are light. Nothing you can do that can't be done Nothing you can sing that can't be sung Nothing you can say but you can learn how to play the game It's easy 
nothing you can make that can't be made No one you can say that can't be saved Nothing you can do but you can learn how to be with time incredibly challenging times. We're just emerging now from a long and dark night of isolation and uncertainty, of pandemic and polarization. We're living through an era of profound moral awakening. The ground is shaking and we've worked so hard, but we're not nearly done. In fact, we're really just getting started. Ikar was founded on the core belief that faith communities need to be not only sources of spiritual strength, but voices of moral courage, that we have to be first responders to indifference and injustice. We hear the voice of our Jewish faith and our Jewish tradition calling us, demanding of us that we become agents of social change. We know and we believe that if we really dream of building the beloved community out there, we have to start by building sacred community right here and right now. A community that stands together in spiritual strength and spiritual resistance. And so we stand in friendship with our multi-faith partners around the country working to build a more just and loving society. We stand in hope because hope is the greatest expression of defiance against a politics of pessimism and a culture of despair. We stand in love because we trust in the mysterious power of human connectedness. This is the real work of community, to show up, to answer each other's loneliness, with presence to say amen to each other's mourner's cottage. And in a world that's turned upside down, 
to remind each other again and again and again what's right side up. Our ancestors were dreamers. They held the audacious belief that every single human being is created in God's own image. Fueled by that prophetic vision, we lift up a theology of radical equality because we truly believe that every single person deserves to live in full dignity. And the only way we build a society of love and justice is together. So come dream with us, come pray with us and cry with us and dance with us and come build with us. Help us usher in this new day.